Thanks for having me. Again, my name is Nathan Brockman and I am the curator of the Butterfly Wing. So normally I get to say, you know, I have a great job that I get to play with butterflies all day, but you all get to work with other fun animals as well. So that doesn't fly as well with this crowd as, you know, the normal group I, I, I get to chat with. Um, I wasn't sure ES or S. Normally when people write the word butterfly or monarch, they always do monarch butterfly. Uh, but there's been a big push lately to stop adding butterfly to the end of every word because it's a butterfly. It doesn't need butterfly added to it. And I know CHs are supposed to have an ES, uh, but when I looked online it was S. So the monarch. Uh, the monarch is sort of that overarching species of butterfly that all children learn about in school. Uh, I am going to try not to sound down on the monarchs, but coming from where I come from, I'm trying to push other species of butterflies as well. And sometimes it's really hard because the monarch gets such a limelight, um, and it does have an amazing behavior and does a lot of amazing things, uh, it just overshadows the rest of the butterfly species, especially what we have here in Iowa. Uh, but it does some wonderful things. Uh, it is one of what, depending on whose list of species you're looking at, is one of 112 species of butterflies found in the state. Um, some lists have it as high as 122 species found in the state. Uh, it's hard to say because everyone has a different list in what they consider actually to be found in the state. Uh, across the nation, the monarch is the state symbol, either as being the state butterfly or the state insect, of seven different states. And at one point in time, I was almost added to that list. But it was stopped because there's a lot of different butterflies and there's a lot of different insects, and why can't we have something unique? Um, seven other states already had the, but or the monarch as their state official insect. Um, I'll come back to that a little bit later in my talk. So monarchs, wonderful critters, uh, do a lot of great things, but they are really a showcase, showpiece, used in a lot of school programming, uh, mainly because of their migration and because they're seen in such large numbers in the fall. If you ask people about butterflies they see, they usually think back to what they saw in the fall and how many monarchs they saw. They weren't watching any other butterflies. They were only that one species. And shortly here, right about now, the monarchs are starting to migrate. Um, if you ask people if they've seen a lot of butterflies, it'll all come down to how many monarchs they see to whether or not they think they've seen a lot of butterflies. Uh, the only other butterfly that kind of shares that stage with the monarch is the painted lady also used in school programs, easy to rear, in large numbers, you can even do it on artificial diets. So they're great for educational programmings. Um, both the monarch and the painted lady are a very uh, weed friendly sort of feeder. They do well on weeds, the milk weed. Um, the painted lady has over a hundred different plants it will feed on, a large list of things. Um, and they have spread themselves out quite a bit. Uh, the, paint, the Painted Lady can be found on every continent except Antarctica. And the monarch, while it used to originally be just found here in the United States, has now, over the many years, moved itself to Australia and New Zealand. Um, can be found in the, uh, see, the Canary Islands sometimes uh, as well because, well, at least it moved to Australia through shipping lines, they believe. It got itself as a caterpillar onto some boats, formed its pupa, and then traveled along. Same came with the painted ladies. And because they feed on so many things, they have spread themselves across the globe. Uh, both of them are pretty much symbols for the butterfly community and are used for a lot of different purposes and symbols. All right, so let's talk about our monarch and some of its visual traits. Um, here is a male and female. So the monarch does show sexually dimorphic traits. You can tell them apart on the wing from a distance. Your male monarchs are going to have these two single dots right here. It's a pheromone pad. Here, I'll do it with the laser so my finger's not in the way. Right here and right here. And if you look on the female, you do not see those pads. Um, that's the area where they will release pheromone as part of their, their mating courtship behavior. Uh, so that's one way you can tell apart. Another way you can tell them is the male's veins that radiate out from their bodies are much smaller than the female's. Now, for this particular trait, you're going to need the two almost side by side to really tell the difference, uh, but, but that is another trait you can use. And females typically are larger than the males. Um, so three easy traits to identify the size uh, of them. 
Now, another trait that monarchs have is their orange coloration. They're orange and black. Butterflies as a whole, they get their color and patterns from the scales that overlap on their wings. So think of the butterfly's wings as being covered with either tiny fish scales or tiny shingles like you'd have on your roof. Overlapping over each other and that makes up all the color and patterns. And the old story goes if you were to touch a butterfly and get that powder on your hand that it wouldn't be able to fly anymore. Well that's not exactly the case. If you knew what you were doing you could rub every single one of the scales off of their wings. The problem is you would drastically affect their quality of life. I'm not suggesting anyone go out and do this either, just in case you're all wondering. Um, they do have a relatively clear membranous wing underneath. Uh, but what happens is if you do rub off some of those colors, the scales, and rub off their color, is you affect the way they look. So in the case of monarchs, they get protection from being orange and black. It tells predators, I'm distasteful, don't eat me. If you rub off the orange and black, or as they get older they get more tattered, um, they lose it on their own, uh, then birds may not recognize that they're orange and black and they should stay away from them. They'll swoop in, they'll eat them. They'll still regurgitate them back up, but they didn't know because the patterns were gone. In other species, it can drastically affect their ability to camouflage, uh, whether it takes away their ability to blend in with different lines, or it takes away some sort of other trait, like we have owl butterflies at the gardens, where they will flash them at predators and the, they look like owl eyes and they will scare them away. Um, and in the case of some species, if you rub off just the wrong spot, they won't be able to mate because they won't be able to show the right visual cues to the opposite sex to say that yes I am or no I'm not receptive to mating with you. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it as well. Uh, there is though, however, the white monarch. Um, it is still the monarch. It's a genetic strain um, it's, you know, just like us having blonde hair or dark hair. Uh, there is a small percentage of monarchs that have the gene where they are not going to be orange. Um, you can actually find them here in Iowa. They're, it's a recessive trait, though, so it, it is hardly ever seen. The one area you can go and see white monarchs in a decent number is Hawaii. Uh, for whatever reason, when they were introduced into Hawaii, there was enough of the the white uh, strain in the population that it's became not dominant but at least prevalent in the population. So not all monarchs are actually going to all be orange. Now there are some other species that try and blend in with the monarchs, take advantage of the monarchs, or close relatives so they share some of the traits as the monarchs. I just have two of them up here. Uh, this is the queen. The queen is, a, is in the genus Danaeus with the monarchs. Uh, the queen is more of a southern U.S. species. You'd find it down in Florida, uh, Georgia, Alabama, uh, wherever along there. And they share a lot of the same traits. This would be a male again. We have our two dots. They're orange in color to warn predators. They're distasteful. They don't have the monarch's characteristic dark lines as much as the monarchs do. They're typically smaller than the monarchs. They don't make a big migration. They just stay in Florida. Here's a mimic of the monarchs. This is a viceroy. This is another Iowa native species. Uh, they take protection from their orange and black, mimicking the monarch. Now, there's been some literature in recent time that says they have a bit of their own protection as well from some of the plants they feed on. Uh, but typically, they believe, at least originally it was, they were mimicking the monarchs so that they were protected from birds trying to eat them as well, or whatever predator could see the orange. The easy way to tell them apart, monarchs, all the monarchs' veins radiate out from the wings, where the viceroy has a line that cuts across. So again, I'll get out of the way and use my laser. You can see right here, this cuts across. If you have that line, it is not a monarch, it is a viceroy. Um, viceroys are also a lot smaller than the monarchs. Uh, they, they never get as large. And uh, you'll find them zipping around. Actually, this year there was a decent population this spring of viceroys outside. Actually, more viceroys than I saw monarchs early in the year. Now, you'll notice this coloration here isn't l as light as our monarchs. It's because this particular species is from a southern location. Um, it was from one of my suppliers, uh, so it came from Florida. And in Florida, they're more trying to mimic the queens. They're in higher numbers down there, so they mimic the queens. Viceroys around here are slightly lighter in color. 
because um, they're more mimicking our monarchs. All right, so to start the story out with the monarch butterfly, we need to talk about the host plants. Without the host plants, you cannot have butterfly. A host plant is just a specific plant that a particular caterpillar feeds on. A female butterfly will not lay her egg on any other plant but on the specific host plant uh, because laying it anywhere else is really just a waste of their genetic material. As part of the exhibit at Ryman Gardens, we can't have any host plants in there. It's one of our USDA regulations. And our butterflies in there will hold onto their eggs until the day they die because they want to wait until they can find that specific host plant. So in the case of monarchs, they can only, as caterpillars, feed on Asclepia, uh, which are the milkweeds. And there are a lot of different kinds of milkweeds. Uh, probably the most common one we have around here is the common milkweed, which is this large big one here. Um, but the milkweed suffers from a unfortunate uh, bit of PR in the fact that it has weed in its name. Uh, there was actually a group of people who tried to change the name of milkweed. The unfortunate part with common names is they get ingrained and you can't change them very easily. But they wanted to take weed out of the name because anytime you say milkweed, people catch on to the weed part really fast. And like, you can't have that in your yard. That's a weed. It says it right in its name. It's a weed for farmers, maybe. Um, but not necessarily in your yard. Uh, there are other kinds of milkweeds. Uh, we have uh, milkweeds that you would find in prairies outside of the common milkweed. Uh, there's the swamp milkweeds, and there's been introduced milkweeds as well, which would be called like the butterfly weed. Um, that's different than butterfly bush. Butterfly bush is budlia. It has lots and lots of flowers on it. Um, that's butterfly bush, which, funny enough, in some parts of the United States is being considered a weed now. Uh, and I know that zoos, especially in California and Florida, have started ripping all of it out because it does spread so well. Um, here in the Midwest, we don't have to worry about uh, butterfly bush because it, it doesn't seed as well because of our hard winters. So, our plants here. The primary, well, this particular plant has a defense built into it. It has a carcinogenic compound in it uh, that makes it distasteful to predators. So most things will not be able to feed on it. The monarchs and a handful of other species have learned over time, they've evolved with the plants, and have developed a method in which they can take up this carcinogenic compound and use it in their body to protect themselves. Uh, so a nice relationship for the monarch, not so great for the plant, because they beat their defenses. At the same time, this plant works as a host plant. It is also a nectar plant, which is funny because a lot of host plants are not also nectar plants. Um, really, if you're, a, if you're a butterfly, you don't want to be eating on the same plant as a caterpillar as you'll be feeding as an adult. Actually, that's one of the perks that insects have over other species, especially those that go through what we call holometabolism where they make that complete change or complete metamorphosis. It used to be the big term, then change it to holometabolist. Um, where the immature stage has a whole different feeding mechanism than the adults do. So they don't ever compete. So caterpillars are feeding on plants, and butterflies are feeding on nectar. So they're two different plants that they're feeding on usually. Milkweed is one of the few plants where they'll feed on it as a larva eating the leaves, and then as an adult drinking the nectar. All right, so eggs. Um, each species of butterfly has a unique egg. You can identify what species of butterfly you're going to get from the egg alone to some degree of certainty. Uh, usually, though, you need some sort of crazy magnification to do it because they're all so tiny. And then each species has their own way in which they lay their eggs. Some females will lay large clusters of eggs together in masses on a plant. You know, 50 to 100 eggs all in one place. Other species will take a lot of time and lay one egg per plant. So it really varies depending on the species. Monarchs are in the ballpark of one egg per plant, maybe a couple here and there on the same plant, but they spread them out. They won't lay the large clusters. So when you go around looking for eggs, it gets very difficult because you don't typically find 100 eggs all together on one plant. You'll find one on this leaf here, one on this leaf down here, one up here. 
Uh, eggs do fairly well. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the problems that monarchs have all the way through the process, but they say that from egg till they form their pupa in the wild, they lose about nine, not, about 90 percent of them do not survive. So only 10 percent of the individuals make it. Now let's start talking about some of the other numbers though involved in this game to make it to where it's not such a sad thing. Um, a monarch female in the wild can lay two to three hundred eggs in her lifetime, which if you weighed all of her eggs um, and her body mass, she can actually weigh, lay more eggs than her body mass. Uh, in, the lab, in a lab setting, a female could lay 700 eggs. Uh, and there's examples in the literature where individuals have laid over 1,100 eggs. So a female, can, with the right conditions, can lay large numbers of eggs over her adult lifespan, which is going to be, and it varies, it could be day one if it flies out and gets hit by a car right away. Um, but you know, we're looking at more for a two to five week time period. So lots of eggs. I had a, you know, a real smart entomologist tell me one time, Nathan, if all the butterflies survive to adult and laid eggs, and then all their offspring survive to adult and laid eggs, we'd be just drowning in butterflies flying around. So it's good that some get eaten along the way. Uh, oftentimes, the first meal a caterpillar has when it's ready to come out is going to be its egg. They'll actually eat their egg first, and then they'll move on to other things. Um, in the case of our monarchs, again, we, we're going to be feeding on milkweed. Um, Basically, caterpillars are eating machines. When they first come out of their eggs, they've got these great big round heads and these really cute skinny little bodies. And then they eat and eat and eat until their body can't handle it anymore. Now, these are insects. They have an exoskeleton. Um, so in order to get larger, they have to molt or shed their skin. Molt is the insect term. Shed is, you know, other animals. Um, but they have to molt or shed their skin in order to get larger. So at that point in time, um, not only do they lose their skin, but they actually take their head capsule off, um, which is a lot of fun. You can actually play with their little head capsules afterwards. Um, and then all of a sudden, again, they have these great big round heads and these little bitty skinny bodies. So basically, they keep growing into their heads each time. Um, these are true insects. Insects have six legs. Now, I have this great example up here. So, I say insects have six legs, but then if you look up here, we can see one, two, three, four. Huh. If we count what look like legs here, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Wait a second, he's way over six already. So in the caterpillars, you have six true legs, six true walking legs, jointed appendages, and they're located right here. Here's our six legs right here. Down here, we call these pro legs. They're not an actual true leg. They're actually an extension of their body. They do have like a Velcro grip tip on the end of them. And um, what they do is they basically stretch their bodies around and can reach and then allow them to hold onto what they're feeding on. So not true legs, the six true legs here. So anytime you got a caterpillar in your hand and you want to talk to kids, it's always a lot of fun to, to see who the really smarty kids are and say, how many legs does this have? And they raise their hand and say, it's an insect that has six. Count them for me! And then they start doubting themselves when they get past six in their counting. Um, but then you turn around and say, these are the true six legs. You were right. It's just a fun game to play with them. Uh, so monarch caterpillars. Uh, monarch caterpillars through their whole stage are protected by their coloration. This bright yellow and black tells predators, I'm distasteful. Don't eat me. Uh, they don't have an easy run of it, though. They're trying to eat a really ornery plant. So the milkweed ha gets its name from that milky sap that is in the plant. If you've ever broken a milkweed leaf before, you've seen that white milky sap come out on there. Um, and then if you've ever touched that white sappy material, you've had your fingers stuck together by it. It's like a latexy sort of compound. Now imagine being a little bitty first instar caterpillar and trying to eat that plant. Oftentimes, what happens to a lot of individuals is they start eating it, and it gets into their mandibles, and they actually glue their mouth shut. So some of the individuals will die because the plant did end up beating them. Also, if they chew the wrong location and too much sap comes out, they can actually get completely surrounded by the milky, sappy solution, 
and die because they basically couldn't move or get away from the plant's defenses. Um, so it's really tricky for them to, to even eat the plant. What a lot of the larger ones do to beat that is they will actually chew a little hole down here to release the pressure. And then they go to the end of the leaf and start eating over there back. So they actually release some of the sap pressure and then eat the leaf. Um, so that's how they kind of beat that later. Um, different milkweed species have different um, levels of toxicity in them. And some of them are so high that even the caterpillars can't handle it and they'll die because of the toxicity in the plants. Um, so it does vary from region to region and some of the environmental conditions that, that affect it. Uh, but luckily, some monarchs still survive after all those trials and tribulations of doing nothing more than just eating the plants. Now, the caterpillars don't have to worry about what they're eating beating them up. They have to worry about everybody else that might want to attack them as well. Um, there are parasitic wasps that will come along and they will sting the caterpillars. And they will lay their eggs inside of the caterpillars. The caterpillar will continue. Yeah, there's some funny looks in the crowd. It's like, what's going on? This sounds like alien. Yes, just like alien. Um, they will lay their eggs inside. They will continue to develop inside the caterpillars. The caterpillar will pupate. And instead of getting a beautiful monarch out of the chrysalis, you get hundreds of parasitic wasps ready to fly out and sting the next monarch. As caterpillars, they can also be eaten. There are insect predators especially that will eat them. They don't even care about the carcinogenic compounds in their bodies. They, they're just a tasty treat. And they will eat them as caterpillars, straight out. They'll, a lot of times they're your true bugs, have a piercing sucking mouth part, they'll insert it into them, and then they'll suck their juices out. Then there's viruses and bacteria and funguses that will attack them as well. So again, hard run to do nothing more than get through your caterpillar stage. And at the end of the day, you hope there's enough host plant on the plant that you were laid on to feed on. Because while there may be one milkweed plant here that's a pretty good size, and one milkweed plant that's over there that's a pretty good size, it's really hard for this butterfly here as a caterpillar to find that milkweed plant over there. Um, so there's a lot of caterpillars that if two or three are laid on one plant, they eat all the leaves and they can't make it through their last instar because there's not enough host plant for them to survive on. So we've eaten all that we're going to eat. We're a fifth instar. It's time to form our pupa or our chrysalis. I'll accept both terms on the test later. Um, so what we're going to do is as our largest caterpillar stage, we are going to molt or shed our skin one last time. A lot of people think that the chrysalis is somehow spun around them. The chrysalis is not spun around them. It is formed during the last larval molt of the caterpillar. What I always think is fascinating in the whole process is the blueprints for the butterfly. Where the eyes are going to form, where the proboscis is going to be, where the wings are going to lay out, is all in the chrysalis as soon as it forms. You can see it. Now, the monarch's probably one of the hardest to find all of that. Swallowtails and some of the air species are a lot better. But you can actually see where the different parts of the butterfly are going to form inside of this. And they have to form inside of each one the exact same way, or it doesn't work. And they will not survive. They, nobody will come out. So we form our chrysalis. This is, in some of the literature, the books, or the folklore, where the name comes from, monarch, having to do with the pupa looking kind of like a crown with its gold spots on there. Um, some of the other ones, what was it? Edward III calling his son, who was something the orange. It's like Prince the Orange or something, the monarch. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of different things where the common name comes from. But one of them has to do with this kind of looking like a crown with all the gold spots on it. Uh, this is a vulnerable stage for butterflies. This is a vulnerable stage for any butterfly. Uh, being that it can't really run away. Now, what most people don't realize is they can still wiggle. Um, so if a parasite lands on it, they'll kick back and forth the best they can to try and chew it away. Or if a predator comes after it, or even just to scare it, 
something like this sitting still and you come upon it and it starts kicking like this, it'll make anybody jump back a little bit. Uh, but the monarchs especially use camouflage. They're using their green to blend in with their surroundings. Now you might think that their gold dots were a little distracting and might make them stand out like a disco ball, but they don't. Uh, when you put this gold coloration in a green surrounding or a brown surrounding, it picks up some of its surrounding colors. It also reflects some of the sunlight, possibly making it look like a dew drop. Um, and if the light hits it just right, it might worry a predator and scare it away because of the flashing light. Um, so it does have a little bit of defense built into it. Your monarchs are going to stay in their pupa for... And any time you put times on insects, it all has to do with temperature. Um, but a couple of weeks in their pupal form. Uh, and then when they get ready to come out, the monarch chrysalis actually turns clear. So you can see the individual inside. Not all pupa do this, uh, but the monarch chrysalis especially does, where it'll turn clear and you can see the orange and black of the butterfly's wings inside before it comes out. So you always know, once you see that, that you've got within about two hours, it's going to drop out. And it's always really fun and exciting. So how does our butterfly get out of here? Basically what our individual has to do is it has to push open the chrysalis and they do it along defined lines. Pretty much every time it opens up in the same places, they'll drop out. Once they drop out, they have these little bitty tiny wings. They will take fluid left over from their caterpillar stage and they will pump that down in the wings, into the veins of their wings. And as they pump it down, their wings will expand. So kind of imagine it like blowing up a balloon. I blow up my balloon, it's fully expanded. Once they've expanded their wings with the fluid, they will then draw that fluid back up into their bodies and then expel it. Um, that's where if you've ever grabbed a fresh butterfly that just emerged, they spray this liquid. And my lab coat at work is covered with green and browns and reds and oranges, all the different colors of meconium that different species can have. Um, and then you will get um, their fully expanded butterfly wings, which basically are made up of veins with dried fluid residue left over um, that form the structure of their wings. So that's how they can be so light, uh, but still fairly strong. Now, chrysalids and cocoons, there is a difference. So some species of moths make a cocoon. Not all species of moths make cocoons. Some have what we call a naked pupa. Uh, but basically, a cocoon is an outer silken coating wrapped around a pupa. So we would also call this a pupa. Uh, and then the actual moth individual is in the pupa. You could cut it out of its cocoon. It would emerge just fine. But a lot of people call the butterfly chrysalis a cocoon, where really the butterfly chrysalis is not spun around, as I mentioned earlier. It's formed during the last larval molt. So the two terms that are really appropriate for a monarch chrysalis is either chrysalis or pupa. So whichever you'd like, but this is a chrysalis, not a cocoon. And then real quick, just some butterflies and moths. Uh, butterflies and moths are essentially the same things. They're both a lepidoptera. Uh, systematically, if you tried to draw the straight direct line between the two, you'd be hard pressed to do it because somebody would say, well, this is a little bit this and this is a little bit that. Uh, but there are some general traits people use to split the two apart. Uh, some are easier than others, though. Um, the best way to tell the two apart, and there are exceptions to even this rule, is to look at their antennas. For the most part, butterflies are going to have a straight antenna with a little knob at the end or a sickle where our moths are going to have a feathery antenna. Now, there are some species of moths that have very small antennas and you can't really tell they're feathery. Um, but that's what works well for a lot of our species here in Iowa. Um, there's other things people like to use, but while this is the one I like to use the most because it's the easiest to identify um, and has the least easy examples, some of the other things people like to use, like moths fly at night and butterflies during the day. Well, there are day flying moths and dusk and dawn flying butterflies. Um, my personal favorite, though, is, well, butterflies are pretty and moths are ugly. Now, wait a second. This is a luna moth. This is an Iowa native individual here. It's actually quite spectacular. We would love to see those outside. 
And to be truthful, there are some species of butterflies that could use a stylus. Um, they're not all that exciting. They're brown and drab and small and meh. So, yes, antennas, one of the best things you can use. But still, not set in stone. All right, so let's talk about the adult monarchs. Um, I'm going to go into migration in a minute here and, and how that all works. But real quick, the average lifespan of an adult butterfly, average of all the butterflies, is going to be about two weeks. That's what all the books use as their average. Monarch here in Iowa could live anywhere from two to maybe five weeks on the long side of things here in Iowa as an adult. Um, so we're not talking about an individual that has a really long lifespan. Um, they get a lot done in that time, though. So in that time, our adult individuals manage to emerge out of their pupa, which is a feat in itself. They manage to spread their wings properly and then fly around and for the males to find the receptive females that they could mate with. Now there's a trick in this. Monarchs will mate with multiple individuals, but only the really what they believe is the last male that mates with the female is the one whose genetic material carries on in her offspring. So you always want to be the last male to mate. So when you find monarchs mating, you'll actually find them coupled together for long periods of time because the male doesn't want to let go and take the chance that that female that was receptive to mating will find another mate to mate with. Um, so you'll actually, sometimes you'll see them flying around with a, you know, one flying and one coupled and hanging down. The individual doing all the work flying around, always the female. The male never flies when they're coupled together. So if you ever see that pair and they're flying, it's the female that's doing all the work. <laughs> Yeah, I know that always gets chuckles from the crowds. It does, it does. Uh, so they found their mates, then the female has to go lay her eggs. She's using chemical volatiles to find her milkweeds. Um, if we have a lot of tall grass prairie that the milkweed's growing in, you're talking about an area where the milkweed may not be the tallest plant out there. The grasses may actually be taller than the milkweeds. Or some of the swamp milkweeds, which don't get very tall, are buried down low anyways. Um, if they're in native habitat. If they're in a garden setting, they're typically their own little space. They got their own little corridor they live in. Um, so they'll use the chemical volatiles from the plants to find out where they need to lay their eggs. They have a very identifiable oval positioning behavior. You can see the monarchs flapping. You can tell when they're ovipositing because they will twist their abdomen around and deposit the egg, usually on the undersides of the leaves. So it's easy to identify when a female is ovipositing. Um, here, I've got two pollinators hanging out together, the uh, honeybee and the monarch. So, not only was it hard enough for them to get their way through their larval stage to become an adult, as adults, they have their own problems to deal with. So, a lot of the insects aren't affected by their chemical defense they have built into them, and they will eat them. So things like our praying mantises or beetles, whatever the case may be, they will just chow down on them. Um, insects are only one threat. Uh, there are um, lots of butterfly casualties through cars. Car v. butterfly impacts. Butterfly always loses. I'll tell you right now. You don't need to read at the end of the book for that one. Butterfly always loses. Um, they actually have done research on what butterfly losses are due to car impacts. Um, unintentional pesticide interactions will take out butterflies. Uh, there's a lot of work slash concern about uh, Bt corn and what Bt corn means for the survival of butterflies. Uh, during the early work on Bt corn, they actually had the Bt expressed in the pollen of the corn and that pollen would rain down on the milkweed that was growing next to the plants. Not only would it be in the leaves, but it rained down in the pollen onto the milkweed around it and the caterpillars would eat it, and they saw, at least initially, what looked like some loss due to them feeding on the milkweed that was exposed to the Bt in the fields. Um, so another possible thing that hurts them as well. Uh, climate change is hard on caterpillars and eggs. Uh, dry conditions will dry out eggs and they will die. Um, it will freeze butterflies if they don't make it out of here in time, which this year they're doing okay. Um, so there's a lot of threats to butterflies and their survival. Again, like I mentioned before, if all of them survived to adults and they all laid eggs and they all survived, 
there would be a lot of butterflies out there. So let's talk migration. This is one of the key features that makes monarchs so spectacular. It puts them in large numbers each year, so we think monarchs, monarchs, monarchs. Um, the way this story works, and it's the same story if it takes place in Canada or starts here in Iowa. The butterflies receive the appropriate conditions from the environment um, as to what the exact conditions that tell them to migrate, we don't really know yet. Uh, it's believed, though, that it has to do with shortening day lengths, temperature changes, um, polarized lights, and other factors. So they will all take the cues that it is time to get out of Dodge, and they will start migrating south. What we find is, is individuals up north, because it gets colder up there first, leave sooner. And they head south sooner. And when they get here, they actually kind of pick up our butterflies and take them with them. So you kind of get this snowball rolling down the hill. Starts out fairly small up north, and as it moves south, it gets bigger and bigger on the way down. It is possible, if you're in the right spots, to see large migratory roosting behaviors. Has anyone seen that? Roosting behaviors where hundreds, thousands of them are hanging out in a tree together. Spectacular when you luck out to see that. Even here in Iowa, you can have that happen. Uh, some people are fortunate and they have it happen every year. Other people, not so much, and it only happens now and then. Um, but they'll move their way down until they get to Mexico. Now, these individuals that are making this trip, these are newly emerged individuals, fresh out of their chrysalids, flying south. They are not going to mate in this process. They're going to store up their energy. And uh, there has been some literature shown that they actually gain weight as they go down nectaring on plants as they move south. So fall nectar plants, important for their migration as well. They are not flapping the whole way down. The monarchs are actually getting themselves up into the jet stream and are being pushed good portions of the way. They're using a variety of things like um, possibly uh, sun orientation, polarized lights, uh, geographic features to help drive them to where they want to go. But they're not perfect at what they do, and large swarms of monarchs have been seen out in the ocean, lost. Um, so much so that uh, there are some anecdotal reports of monarchs being found in, um, in England. Um, and they believe that they actually were individuals that were part of a migration that got themselves lost and over that direction. So that's a long way to fly. Um, large, you know, open ocean shipping freights have been out there and had swarms of monarchs land on them because they're the only thing around um, out in the middle of the ocean. Um, so yes, our butterflies going down. Not all of them make it down here. A lot of them, things happen on the way. They get lost. But a good portion of them make it here. Now I did bring with me, this was my grandmother's book, The Travels of Monarch X. This book was written in like 1966, so it's copyright date. And in 1966, we still didn't know where the monarchs went. We knew they went south, but we didn't know where. It wasn't until about 1977 that they actually found the monarch overwintering spots. Nowadays, it seems hard to think and say, well, why couldn't they find them? These trees are covered with them. And I'll show you some imagery of just how covered they'll be. So east of the Rocky Mountains, heads to Mexico, west of the Rocky Mountains, somewhere in Southern California. Um, the Southern California batch, they believe they're somewhere in the ballpark of 300 different sites they could be hanging out in, in California. But the mountains make a dividing line, and these two are considered two different gene pools. Uh, the USDA says it is so. So I actually don't get butterflies from anywhere over here because they'd be different than our butterflies over here. So anyone that's doing a release of butterflies would not be allowed to buy butterflies in Florida and release them in California. So what does it look like? Here's kind of what it looks like. This is Journeys North, and I'll talk about it a little bit more at the end. But this is a citizen science tracking thing where individuals put in when they saw the large masses of monarchs coming through. And in this particular year, they were leaving Iowa in mid to late September. And they were getting down to Mexico, at least ending in Mexico, in uh, March, or October, not March, October. Um, so it took a long time for them to get down there. It's not an easy, quick flight. It takes some time. 
When they get down there, you get a bit of this. Large numbers of monarchs. Now, most of them, they're going into a winter diapause. They're just sitting, hanging out, taking advantage of the slightly cooler temperatures, storing up their energy reserves. Uh, down here, there might be some mating happening. Um, not all of them will mate at this point in time, but some might start mating while they're down here. Uh, here's a swarm. It's so many on the tree, the branches are hanging down. And it's hard to see in this image, but the tree, which should be a green conifer, is orange. Um, and in this image here, this orange patch here is monarchs. Um, so yeah, that's a lot of monarchs to make a whole patch of conifers turn orange. Uh, and there's multiple places in Mexico where this happens. So they're just hanging out. Uh, they just want to survive. They say that, uh, it's not, not really funny, but if you see a monarch looking for flowers down there, um, to nectar from, that's usually a bad sign because they're running out of energy and they're not going to have enough to make the trip back up north. Um, what happens is it gets warmer down there than it does here. Those butterflies will then start their migration in early spring um, and then they'll get to the southern states where they will mate or mate again and then finally lay their eggs. So the northern migration is nowhere near as organized as southern. Southern, they all work out and go down together. That's why tagging works so well. You can put the little sticker on them, and then you can go to Mexico and find them. The northern migration, they just kind of leave when they want to. You know what? I think I'll go today. I had a good nap last night. I'm ready to go. Let's get out of here. Um, they just kind of trickle their way up. It's a lot harder to track the northern migration. Again, Journey North does it when people first start seeing them. Uh, but they'll leave and they'll move their way north. But once they get into the southern states, Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, Florida, wherever, they will mate, lay their eggs, and die. Their offspring then will eat the milkweed, turn into a chrysalis, and then fly up to us. And then we can have two to three generations that live their whole lifespan here in Iowa. And those are the individuals that live two to five weeks, where the fall generation lived eight months. So a much longer lifespan than the other individuals. Um, now, there are some monarchs that don't migrate. There are populations of monarchs, especially in Florida here, that are there all year round and never leave and reproduce all throughout the year. Um, so not all monarchs migrate. Now, a fun little bit of trivia about Iowa. Iowa's one, and I actually need to change this now, it's only seven states that does not have an official state insect or butterfly. Um, we have a tree and a song and a bird and a lot of other things. Um, and they've actually tried like three different times to get us a state insect. It's dropped all three times. I would vote for more like this sort of butterfly. This is the Rigo fritillary. Rigo fritillary never leaves the state, lives here in Iowa in the Midwest all year round, overwinters as a first instar caterpillar that the female lays in tall grass prairie down on the ground where the host plant will be, but isn't, because it's uh, bird's foot violet or prairie violet, on the ground before it's even there. The only thing this little caterpillar gets to eat in the fall is its egg, and then nothing else until spring, until the plant comes up again. So this is a tough Iowan here. Tough kid. <coughs> so status of butterflies in Iowa. Uh, the monarch is not listed. The monarch is currently not listed anywhere in the United States as being a, a, a T and E species. Uh, Canada does have it listed, and the migration of monarchs is a concern um, because of some of the problems that are happening with its habitat in Mexico, where there's uh, illegal logging is removing their forest habitats, opening it up um, for a variety of different uses, uh, heating homes or just construction purposes. Um, so if those forests go away, the monarchs may not be able to find the suitable habitats for them to survive the winters in. Uh, here in Iowa, we have an assortment of butterflies that are endangered, threatened, because we have lost a lot of habitat here as a whole. We used to be tall grass prairie, not so much anymore. Um, so especially some of our skipper species um, are really hard off because they're dependent on prairie and prairie type plants. Now what you're seeing up here is the state listed species. Iowa currently has two endangered species, five threatened species, and 25 species of concern. 
Now this is the Iowa Butterfly Working Groups list. We've modified it. Um, so on this list here, the endangered species are the dark blue. The lighter blue from that are the five threatened species. The 25 species of concern are the light blue, and the green are the species that have been added by the Iowa Butterfly Working Group as species that need help or some form of assistance in the different levels they are. Um, so we have a lot of species in the state that could use assistance. Um, and a lot of it is habitat loss, uh, but other things as well. Uh, butterflies fluctuate from year to year, and, and those things can cause bottlenecks in the populations and in their genetics. So, some of the programs that are out there already. Uh, Monarch Watch, everyone's probably familiar with it. How many people have tagged a monarch? Anybody tagged a monarch? Okay, not as many as I thought would be in the crowd. Uh, basically, this is where Monarch Watch kind of started. Uh, putting stickers on monarchs and then letting them go and then having researchers in Mexico or actually just using the, the indigenous people to the area to go out and look for the monarchs and then report back on the tags they found. Um, they have since moved into the monarch way stations, which is their gardening program, trying to convince people to plant milkweed in their gardens for the monarchs. Uh, NABA, the North American Butterfly Association, also has their butterfly garden program, which is a little more extensive than the Monarch Watch way stations, which is really more about milkweed for monarchs, where the NABA program is for butterflies as a whole and what's good for butterflies and has different host plants in it. Uh, the Xerces Society had their pollinator habitat program. Um, and these are just three examples. There are lots of different programs like this that have been introduced across the US. Uh, some of them are region-based, some of them are state-based, um, that are along these sorts of lines. But they don't have a ton of people doing them. So, I used to do a lot of talks about butterfly gardening. What's good for butterflies in my garden? Now it's more about what's good for pollinators. With the colony collapse disorder and the importance of pollinators being really stressed in the media, pollinator garden has gotten really important. So some real quick things on some of our pollinators or our butterfly gardens, so you can see what's really similar and close. Um, use natives. As much as possible, use native plants. They evolve together, they do well together. Uh, with butterflies, you plant large clusters of butterflies of plants together because a butterfly has to learn how to feed from a, tic from a particular plant in order to feed. So you won't watch butterflies go from a zinnia to a coneflower to a penta because it takes them a long time to learn how to feed from it. So they like large clusters of the same plants. Uh, some of our bees and other insects like uh, lots of different colors where butterflies may not care as much. Um, you need different size flowers. Some of our smaller butterflies, like our skippers, their proboscis isn't as long and they're small, so they need smaller flowers. Where our monarchs and our swallowtails are larger and can visit a larger flower with a different type of nectar in it. Um, flowers all season long. There are butterflies out there all year round. Uh, the morning cloak, who doesn't feed from flowers, uh, but is a good example because it overwinters in Iowa as an adult butterfly. And even when there's snow on the ground, if the temperature gets above, say, 65 degrees and they can get enough sun on themselves to warm their body up, um, they'll fly around. Uh, so they're an example of one of our earliest flyers in the year. Um, and then host plants. Host plants are very important. If you want to have butterflies, you have to have host plants. Uh, it's just an essential in your garden. And then different height flowers and different shape flowers for the bees. So planting corridor or butterfly uh, gardens. The hope is that you have a habitat. And in that habitat, the butterflies will be surviving well. And then as you add habitats, the butterflies will move out to those habitats. Something like this. Uh, some of them get lost, especially in urban areas or in agricultural areas. They'll fly off and they'll never be able to find the appropriate host plants to survive on. Um, what we really hope doesn't happen as we add more and more of these sorts of things is we end up with something like this, where the genetics keep moving out and these smaller patches end up being sinks. So this is where, when you're doing butterfly gardens, it's a whole lot better if you can get more and more people involved because you end up with this bigger pool, this bigger plot of land, so that as the butterflies are moving out, they can find more gardens and lay their eggs and their populations can continue and they have a way to come back and reintegrate. Um, the roadway cores have become very popular. The idea of using roadways with host plants for the butterflies to move along. So if a butterfly wants to get from Neil Smith to McFarland Park up in Ames, 
it's not going to make the trip in one fell swoop. It won't. Um, but through maybe roadside ditches, uh, city plantings, they could use them as a corridor to move from one location to the other. What you really hope doesn't happen, though, is a situation like this, where the uh, possible parasitic wasp is well established in one area, but not another, and you open a, a corridor up to whatever the potential pest is that attacks them. Um, there's a bacteria, Wachobia, which is really bad for uh, butterfly conservation right now because you can have a population with Wachobia and they can survive just fine. And you can have a population without Wachobia. If you mix those two populations together, it can actually um, cause uh, genetic problems and they will not mix and it'll hurt the uh, the number of individuals in the wild. So it's, it's a real tricky ball game to do uh, conservation and you have to really watch all the aspects when you're doing it. So at Ryman Gardens, we have an assortment of things. We have the Iowa Butterfly Survey Network. It's a very small program we've just been kind of playing with for a handful of years, getting citizens out into the wild counting butterflies. Uh, we've got about 12 different sites that are being surveyed right now. We're hoping to grow that a lot. Um, Illinois and Florida have really big programs, and just recently we've kind of joined forces and we're looking at a nationwide similar program to get people out in the, out in the field checking on butterflies. Uh, we have been doing some, and I have some with me here. I brought some of our peck skippers. I've got some peck skipper caterpillars. We've been working on captive rearing of native species, developing protocols so that when the time comes that we want to do captive rearing for reintroduction, we've got some good protocols built together. Um, so come up and see my cute little peck skippers before you leave today. They're cuties. Uh, we are working with an Iowa State computer programming class on a program called Uber, a Unified Butterfly Recorder. And what it is is a uh, smartphone, actually the initial round is Android based, but eventually it will be iOS as well, um, application where people can enter butterfly surveys into a tablet and it will track a lot of the background information that often gets missed in paper versions. And then at Ryman, we have what we call Day of Insects, which is a day-long 15 presenter uh, program series where people can come that are insect enthusiasts, insect professionals, amateur entomologists. Um, it's a good mix of people from all over the Midwest come and spend some time talking about uh, butterflies and other insects and insect issues. Uh, some other programs that are available and are great citizen science sort of uh, elements. Uh, there is the Monarch Larvae Monitoring Project, um, which actually is fairly new, uh, but is all about going out and looking for caterpillars on milkweeds. There is the migrant, oh, this is Journeys North. So Journeys North, which I mentioned before, where you can actually go on and you can just enter when you see butterflies first in the spring or when you see the masses flying south right about now. Um, in their thing, you'll be a cute little dot. Uh, one of the unfortunate parts about Iowa and being dots is a lot of times in these insect-based websites, Illinois will have dots, Nebraska will have dots, Kansas will have dots, all of our northern states will have dots. Iowa will be this big open white spot. There's just not enough people for some reason working on looking in their yards for these insects. Um, it's unfortunate. Uh, another program done out of Iowa State is the Vanessa Project, which actually tracks the migration, monarchs aren't the only migrators, the migration of red admirals, painted ladies, American ladies, um, as they move north and south as well. Butterflies and Moss in North America is a site where you can just see a butterfly in your backyard and go onto their website and put it in, and they will track it and keep that record forever. Um, so it's another nice site. Uh, out of Canada, eButterfly starting out. Uh, same sort of thing. You see anything in your backyard, you can report it to them. They'll love it. It's great. There's other citizen scientist programs out there that are outside the butterflies because while butterflies need help, other insects need help as well. Um, bee Spotter is an Illinois project. Um, it's funny, Nebraska has their own bee project as well. Iowa in the middle, we don't have a project. Um, but Bee Spotter uh, is a fun one where they check, track bumblebees and honeybees and other bees. Um, the Last Ladybug Project, which is a fun one, they check our ladybugs, not the Asian lady beetle that's invading everyone's home in the fall, but the species that have been displaced by the Asian lady beetle. Um, so it's fun, and you can see all the lady beetles that people find in their backyards. 
Dragonflies, which I consider next in line as far as people enjoying them after butterflies. Um, something about the majestic flight of the dragonflies. Um, there is a dragonfly migration website as well where you just anyone can go out to a pond and survey um, uh, dragonflies as they're doing their migration flights. And another resource everyone in Iowa should know is Bug Guide. Have any, anyone been on Bug Guide? Okay, good. Whole another population of people that should be on Bug Guide. Uh, Bug Guide is actually housed out of Iowa State. It was just started by an amateur entomologist who just wanted people to have a place they could identify insects. You can go on Bug Guide, you can put an insect picture up there and say, what is this? And you will have amateurs, hardcore amateurs, <laughs> professionals, uh, researchers will answer your question. They're all in this community. And some of the great things that have come out of this is, you know, there has been cases where youth, you know, seven-year-old, found something in their backyard, put the picture up on Bug Guide. The leading expert of that species in Germany was on Bug Guide, saw it, and it's like, we didn't even know this was found in that area. This is outside of its range. How wonderful is this? And they're actually, you know, through this, and through a lot of these citizen science things, great research is coming out of them. Um, so it's a good resource. So I recommend anyone, you know, if you want to know something, you know, I saw this caterpillar and it was green and blue. Just go on there and type green and blue caterpillar into the search and it'll show you pictures of green and blue caterpillars. And you'll be like, ah, it was that one. Um, it's a great way to learn your insects because really everyone should kind of have a, at least an understanding of the insects that are in their backyard um, because they play a huge role in our environment. And with that, I believe, yes, I will open the floor to questions. I don't uh, well, you want it to be a sunny location. Um, so a, an open, sunny location that doesn't receive too much shade. Um, so definitely not under a tree because a lot of your, your butterfly plants are going to need a lot of sun. They're nectar plants. They're not shade loving. Um, protect it from the wind if possible, so some break somewhere so that it isn't constantly being beat by our, you know, strong Iowa winds, also another nice piece. Um, outside of that, just about anywhere can work. There are a lot of host plants because each species of butterfly has their own host plant requirements. Um, so if you like the black swallowtail, planting things like darts parsley, dill, fennel, or carrot tops, um, you know, that's a host plant for the black swallowtail. Uh, if you like the red admiral, which I mentioned earlier, um, they feed on things like stinging nettle and false stinging nettle. Um, not as loved as much by gardeners, but again, if you want them, they, that plant needs to be out there somewhere. I don't recommend people put it in the front of their gardens, but allowing it to grow in the back corner of your yard isn't a bad thing. Uh, painted ladies will eat a lot of different things, so having plants pretty much covers them. Um, so it depends on what species you're talking about. A lot of our skipper species, they're grass feeders, so they need different types of grass. And they need it not to be mowed constantly, um, because then you just mow them up. So, yes. It's sad, but it's true. It's, 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 ra it's really rare um, for them to end up over there anyways. There's only a handful of cases. Um, so no, it's not happening more. It's not happening less. You know, it's over the last X number of years since it's been recorded, there's probably only maybe eight records of it. Um, but for them to show up over there is still, wow, what's going on? Yeah, somebody got lost. Somebody's batteries in their GPS died. Through the pet trade. Uh, yes, there are problems. You guys are from a whole different world than, than us. Yes, there are insects in the pet trade. Uh, butterflies are kind of in the pet trade. As far as being a problem for pushing out other native species, not as much. Um, where they become a problem is they'll feed on something. And if that plant happens to be one of our native plants, and it's especially if it's one of our agricultural plants, the problem comes in is 
now we have this new pest that has to be treated for. It has to be sprayed for. It has, you know, some control method has to be developed. Um, that's why the USDA is, has such strong restrictions on the importation of um, Lepidoptera is so they don't get out into the wild and establish themselves. Uh, there's a huge worry of that. Um, but uh, the pet trade has not been a big problem when it comes to butterflies. Um, the biggest problem it would probably cause is if they were found, say, in Iowa, the first place they're going to look to blame for the species being found in the state is Ryman Gardens or Sophia Sachs in Chicago. Or, what is it, Sophia? Sophia Sachs is in Missouri and Peggy Nonberg in Chicago. I mean, one of the flight houses would get blamed for a species being found in the middle of the state, most likely, is what would happen. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you for having me.